Android Store. Today's episode is brought to you by the Bureau for Tourism in Baotou, China. If you're planning a trip to the People's Republic, consider adding Baotou to your itinerary. The City of Steel, Baotou. Episode three, season three of Killer Means Awesome featuring Killer Inventions. Colonel Troyer, welcome to episode three. Uh, thank you very much. I had to stop dancing. There's something about that music that just really gets me moving every, yeah. every time. Yeah, it's like very can, bouncy. Yeah, you can just picture the guy at the piano, like old time, <laughs> like he's got like the band around his shirt sleeve, like, you know. Right, and the chemist in the background dropping beakers. I mean, there's a lot of action. I picture it more of a saloon, like a Western saloon. Ah. It's just late in the night and the party's gotten a little out of hand and glasses are falling off the bar. Yeah, not a lot of saloons have Bunsen burners, but still, True. I get your vibe, and the party atmosphere is undeniable. Where did people tune in uh, from last week? Fantastic. You know, one thing I wanted to mention about last week, last week we featured the inventor essentially of the color purple, right? It was the Perkin purple. And I must say, and maybe it's one of those things where once something is brought to your attention, you notice it everywhere. But I feel like purple is again, the it color. Like you see certain celebrities, you see certain people uh, in the media, and it just seems like purple is the rage again. I had the same reaction. I think it, I I thought, oh, I must be looking for it. But it, and it got me thinking, you know, what's the thinking behind it? Like when the celebrity has the purple dress or has right. the, like, are they thinking of some of the associ- associations we talked about the, you know, royalty or is it just more kind of, you know. Yeah, is that their stylist just saying, here, put this on. But the, yeah. the, the other thing is that it is a very appealing color. Like I, the more I have learned about it, the more I've gone on to appreciate the color purple, I must admit. The Perkin purple in particular. That's a the great Perkin shade. The Perkin purple. Yeah, that's a yeah. great shade. Yeah, Mauvienne. Uh, we got a night. We got a nice email from a kid up in Vancouver, BC. No way. Ben H. Yeah, Ben H. Sounds like he's a college student. He heard the part where I was sort of fumbling around saying that I remember vaguely something about colors in the class, in the Iliad and the Odyssey, mm-hmm. and there's some oddity about why aren't there more? He said what I was uh, trying to get to there was scholars have wondered why the word blue doesn't pop up back then in hmm. um, the odyssey or the iliad right. yeah, or you the mentioned Bible. that in the last episode that, but you, you you said that people didn't have the word for the color so they just didn't yeah, articulate i it. just didn't i know but i didn't this guy said it's specific to blue Got and it. he said there's different theories about that one of them is that maybe back then people depending on the shade of blue they were kind of grouping it in the same word for black or if it was a lighter oh. blue they kind of group it with green or you know there's different theories about it but i thought it was more generally for colors back then but he said no it's it's a weird thing with blue where they hmm. scholars were trying to figure that out like why is that not you know why he's talking about you know, the wine dark sea, you know, uh, Homer, he's describing things, you know, that normally, you know, you think, okay, maybe pop in a blue here and it never comes in. So when did blue come about? Like when did people start speaking about the blue sky or the blue later on? Okay. It, it was yeah, later yeah. On. a little bit later, yeah. a little bit later. Okay. Well, that clarifies sort of that whole blue issue, but you had originally asked about where people were tuning in from. Yeah. In last episode. Georgia? Let me guess. Georgia? Canada? You're wrong. But you're not wrong if you were to expand out and consider a general region. And by that, I mean, hello to our good friends in Brandon, Mississippi. That's the South, right, Georgia? That's amazing. Yeah. Mississippi, huh? Yeah. Brandon, Mississippi. No idea where that is. Remember when you learned how to spell Mississippi, you felt so smart because of all those double S's and P's? Yeah, and it's such a long word. And you're like, oh my God, look at me. I can spell that word. Look how many letters are in there. That's Brandon, Mississippi. Fantastic. You know, happy to have those listeners. 
and uh, and we and we focused on Mississippi back uh, in killer biographies. We talked about old Medgar Evers. We he did. Was a, yeah, proud son of Mississippi. Let's also then go ahead and say hello to our good friends in Amarillo, Texas. So still oh, Southwest, man. Mississippi Fantastic. and Texas this week. There's an old country song, Amarillo by Morning or something like that. That's a good tune. But so that's Texas. So hello to Amarillo, Texas. And then finally, let's say hello to Port Elgin, Ontario. So Port Elgin, hello. Hello, Port Multiple Elgin. Multiple listeners in Port Elgin. Remember, we have to have at least two in any place I mention. Boy, we really spread across Canada. I mean, we get them from Saskatchewan. We got the email from Ben in Vancouver. Now we got somebody in, or a couple people at least, in Port Elgin. It feels like we ought to start adding some more uh, Canada-centric content or something. True. Or I feel like, should we be opening a Canadian office? But then I figured, well, we don't have an office here. But still, it seems like we should expand, right? Canada. Canada's big. You give me and you give me a hard time about always bringing up ice hockey, but maybe that's why we're uh, grabbing the Canadian audience. Yeah, good point. You know, there are. I looked it up because I, I had anticipated uh, the potential of a hockey uh, tie-in from from you. Port Elgin, the home of four to five current or former NHL players. So Port oh, Elgin, man. actually known for uh, prowess in hockey. Yeah, which I thought you'd enjoy. Fantastic. Yeah, I kept that one in my back pocket uh, for you. Because uh, I, I had a feeling hockey might get mentioned. Well, speaking of one in the back pocket, yeah. I am going to uh, weasel in here on your regular segment Hello. and tell you that we had a listener last week from the little town in the mountains of uh, Western North Carolina, okay. the little town of Brevard. Never heard of it. Wow. Okay. Near near Asheville. West, oh, yeah. Asheville. Yeah, that's a popular uh, area of North Carolina. Well, Asheville's popular. Brevard is is a little place, just 7,000 people. Yeah. And, and old friend of mine, Dan DeWitt, who used to, uh, who showed me the ropes when I was a young reporter down in Florida. Nice. He and his wife now live up in lovely Brevard. Okay. I looked it up. You know what it's uh, famous for down there? I have there? no idea. Apart from being right next to a national forest, which is cool. And home to a friend of yours. <laughs> yeah, that's what it's, it's famous for. Famous so they, got, your circle. They, got, they got white squirrels. What? Like bright white squirrels. Like albino squirrels? There. Yeah, that's what it looks like. Hmm. Color of snow. Who started that experiment? And how did it escape from the house and <laughs> multiply to the point where now this town is overridden with these white squirrels? <laughs> There's different theories. Okay. One is that a circus truck <laughs> or a carnival truck or something overturned and the, you know, the freakish white squirrels. Sure. got loose started reproducing yep that happens yeah <laughs> i can see that welcome brevard wow, yeah good to hear from brevard and uh that's about yeah. it okay let's get into it this is I, I got a hot one here let's make some audio magic uh so dr geller uh some of our inventions so far have been largely stories about an individual last week was a good example who was solely responsible for a key innovation today's story is not that really? today's story is a team effort from start to finish. And the star of the show is the invention itself, not the various people who perfected it through the years. And for today's episode, we are not going to the world of chemistry. We are going into aviation. Okay. I love it. Ready to take off on this new adventure in inventions now, related you to aviation. never would um, bite on my previous idea of doing a season of killer plane crashes. No, never. <laughs> Won't do it. So this it's is, retiring before I do that. This is my sneaky sideways uh, maneuver to talk about some plane crashes anyway. <laughs> Fair enough. All right. Under the guise of inventions, I'm going to let it slot. Thank you. So let's start with a couple of important dates, which some of our listeners will be well aware of because we've covered them in previous episodes. But 1903, uh, speaking of North Carolina, that's when the uh, those crazy Wright brothers fly the very first oh, yes. airplane near Kitty Hawk. Kitty Hawk. Yes, of course. Yeah. But very brief, right? Like a, a, it was sort of like a 20 feet. Like, was that really a flying? Well, it sure. counted. It counted. Yeah. Okay. But the crazy thing, which you were the one who, who brought this to light for me, it's just 16 years after they fly that plane for like a second and a half. 
<laughs> that we have Alcock and Brown yeah. flying the first successful transatlantic flight. Uh, right. Just a incredible, ridiculously brave, unlikely feat, uh, which you told us about in episode eight of season two. Yes. That was a really good story. I, yeah. Yeah. For people who haven't heard that one, I, I strongly recommend it. Uh, so those are just two important dates. And, and even just with those two, you get an idea that aviation's not very old and people are already moving forward fast. It's like, oh, wow. great. You guys so did scary. it down on the beach in North Carolina. Look what we can do. We're going to go across the ocean. Right. And today we're nervous when we get on a commercial flight, which has a 99.9999999 chance of being perfectly fine. You know, accident rates, relatively speaking, are you know incredibly rare to be in an airplane crash, yet we're scared to death when we get on these flights. And then you have the Alcock and Brown guys, like no one's ever crossed the ocean in an airplane and they're like in an open cockpit like let's go let's do it <laughs> like the, the, the you know the it's it's insane what we consider scary versus what it used to be like and i take your point about the 99.999 um but i will just add it may not feel that way at the end of this episode oh shoot okay so my math is off in the no, I'm not no your math. math is correct i'm just i'm just saying we're gonna focus on sometimes when things went wrong um, yeah. Okay. Yeah, see, I have. I am scared of flying. I don't like any of it. But anyways, okay. I am now after researching this. Okay, okay. Oh, <laughs> we're gonna lose. People. We have so few. We're gonna lose our audience. Okay, go on. I'm just saying, if you're in Port Elgin and you're considering a trip, you know, maybe consider the car. <laughs> You know what I mean? <laughs> Just take the extra time. Okay. In the early years of aviation, lots of invention and experimentation, new technologies being developed all the time. Some, And, and we saw that a little bit on the Alcock and Brown flight where they had various little gadgets that were brand new. And one of them came up with something called a spirit level, which I don't even remember what that was, but it just gives you a feeling like people were you know, trying new stuff, building stuff, saying, ah, oh, maybe this will work. Okay. Well, in adopting technologies from, you know, seafaring or from crossing oceans and trying to somehow apply that to air travel. So one objective early on when all this experimentation uh, was going on was to be able to understand and record moment by moment exactly how the plane was performing, how high it was going, how fast it was going, wanting to just know exactly, because as you showed with that transatlantic flight, you know, back then flying a plane was no joke. So you're very busy. You're not sitting there and like recording data, you know, you're just trying. To right. Like, no, it's like a physical activity. Right. It's really draining. Yeah. Okay. So there is this mission to, can we come up with something that just tells us exactly what the plane is? is doing okay interesting okay. do you are you starting to get an idea of what we might be talking about today well um yeah of course i have a general idea what year are we speaking about like when is all of this discussion it, it really heats up around world war ii and it heats Got up it. around military aircraft and during test flights of military aircraft and also during combat missions what we're talking about today and i'm going to use the term that you and i grew up with i think now mm -hmm. maybe people are moving away from it but today we're talking about the black box Oh, yeah. The That's what is found when there's an accident, and then you get all the pertinent data. You got it, baby. Wow. Yeah, that's always the scary thing, because it's like, well, why can't they make the... And some comedian have the... Yeah. Why can't they make the entire plane George the Carlin. of the black box? Yeah, George yeah, Carlin. Yeah, I love he, that joke. Yeah, he pointed <laughs> out, like, every time there's a plane crash, there's the reporter saying, these things have been shockproof. They can survive, you know, 10,000 feet underwater. They can survive a... He's like, cool. So why not make the rest of the plane? <laughs> um, yeah, so that was to capture uh, data related to what went wrong. So it's sort of like, but but they may have also used it to analyze flights and, and so exactly. on. Exactly. So I think early on, it was in connection with just, um, sort of the birth of aviation and understanding planes and running test flights. And later on, uh, especially in the era of commercial aviation and people taking planes to get places, that's when it, it that's when the black box comes into the accident investigation. Interesting. So the black box, which I'm, I'm guessing this is what we're going to be speaking about in terms of an Correct. invention. Was that a government thing or was that a company thing? Who, who started this idea of the black box? Thing. Nice. Good segue. Okay, one of the okay. two of the very two of the first people who were working on it were a couple of Frenchmen, uh, Francois uh -huh. 
Ousano. Definitely sounds French. And Paul Baudouin. Baudouin. Mm, both. Okay, both yeah. very French. Sounding. Super yeah. French. Okay. Yep. They used photography for the task. They got, uh, they built a device where a thin ray of sunlight was deviated by a tilted mirror, which would hit photographic film, which was scrolling along inside the plane. And somehow this film was capturing a record of how high and how fast the plane was going. Don't ask me how. But it worked. It seems like needlessly complicated, like Rube Goldberg device. Like, just ask the co-pilot to write something down. Like, that that seems like you're going to an extreme. Like, we're not necessarily solving the problem. We're just resolving it in a way that's more time-consuming and annoying. Right? <laughs> the, uh, yeah. Like, that's that's not the good first. Don't not bother the best the way. Although it does kind of hang on in France for a while using the uh, photographic that's film. That's cool. Of course, because they appreciate the, the intricacy. Like, oh my God, this is the most complicated, bizarre way of capturing this data. But thank you for it, Francois. Okay. What? In, in uh, England, they're trying a different approach. We got I'm a couple like of, this approach. More, we got a couple of people over there named Len Harrison and Vic Husband. Come on, Vic. Okay, they do better than the light with the capture and the film scrolling like something so impractical. <laughs> they come Give up me something with a, better. <laughs> they they come up with a device which uses a copper coil and like it, it uses already. Separate styluses, which are connected to different instruments on the plane, and these styluses make tiny indentations at regular intervals on the copper coil. Sounds a lot more practical, despite my not understanding anything you just said. Well, it's just like, you know, it, instead of the film, it's copper. Another very good one early on, apparently, was made in Finland. This is also during World War II, and that's by an engineer named Veho Hitala, and he names his device. The Matahari. Now, uh, you remember Weird. who Matahari is? Yeah. She was she was like an exotic Why? dancer. <laughs> I don't know. That seems so strange. So like, strange. You I had mean, me like I thought this guy was going to be cool. Like what are you doing? You name <laughs> no, it after a stripper. Apparently was, is good. He names it after a stripper who was also an alleged uh, German spy in World War One. And okay. I tried to figure out okay, well, what connection does this have to your flight recorder? But the truth is, everybody was naming everything <laughs> after Matahari back then. Race horses were getting named after Matahari. Uh, okay. Yes, All long. Right. Okay. were named after her so so unoriginal but not unexpected is what you're saying given Correct. the time um okay. oh and the u.s air force during world war ii tried something different they said you know what would be cool is if we used some sort of recorder that would record the conversation among crew members on a bombing mission Whoa. and so they use a magnetic wire recorder on a b-17 combat mission over occupied france in 1943 and they're so happy with the results of it it's so kind of exciting and puts you right in the action that they immediately make it available just two days later to american audiences on radio and so what? people on the radio can hear exactly what these guys were saying to each other on the bombing run over occupied France. Wait, they're making that available to anybody? Like public yeah, radio? Yeah, that went out over the radio. So like you could be a kid at home listening to pilots on a bombing mission? And it, it happened at least once. I don't know if they did it on the regular, because I could imagine that, you know, at a certain point it becomes like a security risk if you're giving stuff right. away. But it definitely got people psyched up and like go right. team. Put it on and, delay. It still would just be cool to hear yeah. that. Now, what we call today, what we think of today as the black box is actually really two components. One is what I already talked about with the the recording data about the flight and mm -hmm. then the second part is what i just referenced is the voice recorder which voice, is capturing right. what's the pilot saying what's the co-pilot saying you know what's going on in the key moments I mean, this this is early right because it's like storage would be an issue just in terms of like when you think of like floppy disks in the 90s or 80s you know like so back in the 40s or 50s like I, was, I, I wonder how they were capturing so much Good data. Point. And, you know, one of the problems with the French method, which you um, were skeptical about, is that, you know, you couldn't, you couldn't reuse the photographic film, whereas some of, <laughs> of these other methods you can reuse. The Amongst stuff. other flaws, but yes. So one of the guys who gets interested in the whole concept of recording the audio that's going on in the cockpit is an Australian man named, uh, he's a scientist named David Warren, mm -hmm. and his specific aim was to assist with airplane crash investigations. And he says, wouldn't it be nice if we could know exactly, you know, what this 
crew was saying as they were scrambling to try to avert disaster. So he builds the first combined unit for both flight data and cockpit conversation. Uh, he designs it with civilian aircraft in mind. So now we're moving. Is he Australian? He's Australian. Say? And we're moving out of World War II. And now people are starting to think more in a commercial context. Yeah. Uh, so he builds this thing. It's pretty effective. And nobody gives a hoot. Nobody's interested in it. Nobody wants anything to do with it. But he gets a lucky break when it comes to the attention of Sir Robert Hardingham from the British Air Registration Board. And he, when he hears about it, immediately recognizes the value of it, significance of it. And he brings this guy Warren over to England. He says, I want you to show some of our people how it works you know, work with some of our scientists, really, you know, perfect it. And they're the ones who also come up with a really strong shockproof case for it. Oh, and they mm -hmm. paint it red. So this thing, this device winds up being called the red egg because it's in the shape of an egg and it's bright red. And so, yeah, good for David Warren. So he's one of our key uh, inventors on this story. Wow. By 1965, they've decided um, just looking at the way plane crashes go and how which parts of the plane sustain the most damage, they come up with the idea of like, we should move this thing to the back of the airplane. There's going to be a better chance that it's going to survive impact. And right. so that remains the case today. The, the black box is in the back of the plane, not the cockpit. Okay, right. 1967 in June is one of the first successful recoveries of a flight data recorder after a crash. So had companies adopted just every commercial flight would have the black box? Or how did he get the black box into these flights? Great question. By the mid-1960s, countries are starting to require it. It's not um, mandatory okay. all around the world, but in Australia, in America, in England, they're, they're becoming mandatory. Certainly by the end of the 60s, basically, if you're on a commercial plane anywhere in the world, it, it's required to have a black box. And uh, is it his patent? Is it his black box? Or you know, are there uh, multiple providers? As I said, there's so many different people working on the same device. His right. his is popular. It's probably his that's in this. There was a famous plane crash called the Stockport Air Disaster in June of 1967. And this is one mm -hmm. of the first times where they do find the recorder and they get valuable information from it. This right. was a flight carrying vacationers back from Mallorca. Never uh -huh. been. I've never been. Yes. I've never been Another, either. Yeah. Sounds yeah. nice. Okay. Sounds Coming great. back from Mallorca, they crash near Stockport, England, killing 72 <sighs> of the 84 people on the plane. <sighs> In Terrible. that case, the data from the flight recorder helped to reconstruct exactly what had gone wrong in the moments before the crash, mm -hmm. which was basically engine failure due to some flaws in the plane's fueling system. Ooh, okay. And it's a good thing that they were able to find the flight recorder because the pilot, who was one of the one of only 12 people who survived the crash, could not remember a damn thing about any of it. You know, just what? total amnesia about all of it. I mean, you know, he sustained head injuries. Right. He's oh, like, I, he's, he said, sorry, boys, I have no, I don't remember that day. You know, wow. But wow. the the but the flight recorder showed that actually that pilot was somewhat of a hero. You know, the plane was basically uncontrollable by the end, but he was doing everything he could to keep it from um, hitting the the town center in Stockport. <sighs> it's like a little you know town, and right. so it looked as if he was just trying to put it into a field or something like that. Wow. Okay, in the United States around that time, the guy to talk to about flight recorders was a professor at the University of Minnesota. Go mm -hmm. Golden Gophers. Golden Gophers. Yeah. Yes. Great name. Yep. Big time. Okay. And um, the professor was James J. Crash Ryan. Cra what? Wait, That's Crash? his nickname. So Crash, okay. Professor Crash, was awarded patents for two successful devices in the 1950s and 1960s. And he has mm -hmm. been described in trade journals in America as the father of the black box. Wow. He okay. incidentally is the same guy who invented retractable seat belts for cars. 
If, I'm not but, kidding. Wait, he did the seatbelt and the black mm-hmm. box? Wow. But it's unclear to me if he gets the name Crash on account of the automobile work or the plane work or both. I don't know. Yeah, you think you would know that because he seems to be featured pretty significantly. Well, right? I don't know. We're running through a whole bunch of people here. That's what true, I'm saying. It's true. a team effort. Right, but a name like Crash, you'd be like, all right, why is he called Crash? Okay, I, I'll, let me just quickly look that up. Okay. There was an editor at my newspaper in Florida who called me Crash because he said I was always running out to Fatal Rex to you know report on Fatal Rex. <laughs> So he would call me Crash. Okay. So there you go. But you knew why, right? Yeah. So you're telling us his name was Crash and then I ask you why and you're like, I don't know. It's like, well, but if I ask you, you told me because your reporter friend named you that. Arguably, the- I was doing less valuable work than Professor Ryan. <laughs> Okay. The um, so gradually the device gets perfected. Now this whole concept, though, that the the black box is also going to be recording conversation in the cockpit. Yeah. The pilots, air crew, they're not totally psyched about that at the beginning. So was there no recording, like with the with the control tower? Like the, there, there's no recording. Sometimes uh, there is. Sometimes you can okay. get that, but not always. I mean, it, it depends right. on are they in in touch? Are they in contact right. with the tower at that moment? You know. But not what they're doing in the cockpit. But like if they're not talking to the control tower, you're not capturing what they're saying to the. Co-pilot. I mean, there's different devices that do different things, but mo- mainly I think it is to the tower. But some of the no, but I think it also it does capture communication among the crew because one of the things that that bums out the crew initially is like it feels weird. It feels like a little bit of an invasion of privacy or something. Like if we're right. good, speaking right. honestly about stuff, you know, and then it's it's all on tape. You know, it's early on, and right. people aren't used to the concept concept of everything you do is being videoed or taped. Yeah, I can see and that. And so Professor, or no, not Professor Ryan, somebody else by this point, so a guy from Lockheed says, okay, I, I've got a fix for that. He's He puts a um, spring-loaded switch on the cockpit uh, sound recorder so that if it's a successful landing, if it's a safe landing, they can just flip that switch and it just erases everything. Oh, interesting. So if you were, you know, making off-color remarks or, you know, dirty jokes or whatever, right. you know, or you're you're complaining about, you know, this uh, flight attendant or this passenger, you know, it all gets erased. You just right. flip okay. the switch. Okay. As I said, by the mid-1960s, these things are becoming a requirement for all commercial aircraft. Now, one question, you know, so I mentioned that that early one was called the Red Egg. And in fact, the black box was never black. Oh, why did they call it that? <laughs> well, I'm going to tell you. <laughs> okay, good. I was like, please tell me, you at least look that up. Like if you would have come back and said like, I don't know. Like, Let's go. Come on, man. This is the title of the show. Black right. Box comes from a different aspect of aviation during World War II. Okay, hold on. Before you oh, tell us. yeah. Pay the bills? Well, I'm just thinking of what a great hook. Because I'm actually now super curious. You you told us that the black box is, in fact, not black. So we don't know why it's called the black box. And, you just, and I'm guessing it's not because it turns to charcoal if it's in a crash. I mean, a lot so, of times it does. But yeah. It does. Perfect true. cliffhanger. But I'm, I'm, yes, that's a good cliffhanger. Let's hear from our new sponsor. And then on the other side, we'll hear why, in fact, it's a black box and the further adoption of that technology. Fantastic. If you're planning a trip to China, consider adding a stop in Baotou. The earthquake, street crime, and environmental issues are truly yesterday's news, thanks to the diligence and conscientious efforts of local officials. The City of Steel is once more the jewel of Inner Mongolia, Baotou, much safer than it used to be. Our new sponsor, obviously, we're super excited. I've never been to Bateau, China. Have you? Yeah, me neither. That's that's a Lizzie job right there. I got I felt a little weird reading that one. That's not a great slogan. Like much, it's uh, much safer now. Like, well, you also said. I think you had to read that it was yesterday's news. To me, it's like okay, that was yesterday. Like you know, that's very recent. The other thing is uh, Bateau. I did look up the fact that over half of rare earth minerals are produced in Bateau. Well, that's cool. I mean, that gets me interested. But apparently, it's led to environmental contamination. 
like like you've never seen before. So it's like a double edged sword, right? Okay, well, yeah. Rare earth minerals sounds great. Uh, tremendous environmental contamination, yin yang. I don't know if that's Chinese, but anyways, I don't know if they're ever going to advertise. Yeah. <laughs> they're ever going to advertise with us again after that little uh, yeah. little bit of extraneous research. Well, I thought you did a very enthusiastic reading. I thought it came across as 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 very pro bateau and and made me curious as to whether I would consider ever visiting that area of of Mongol China. Honestly, it sounds a little sketchy. Sounds horrible. Anyways, all right. So, Colonel Troyer, Black Box, what the heck? How did it get that name? Okay. So, during World War II, a lot of uh, military planes were using electronic devices to help with radio, radar, and navigation. And these were sometimes secret electronic devices, like newer technology. Mm -hmm. And they would put them in like really nondescript sort of housing in the in the plane instrument panels and stuff um, in case, you know, like the plane crashes and the enemy recovers it. And they just would house these devices in sort of like just real, you know, as I said, nondescript black boxes. Right. So, you know, to just sort of disguise them or not draw attention. So that's when the term black box first starts getting used in connection with aviation. And they start using that same term for the flight recorder, even though pretty early on people realize, wait a minute, if part of the deal here is to find this thing after a wreck, maybe black is not going to work so well. Like right. maybe, you know, orange or <laughs> red hey, great or point. fluorescent. Yeah fluorescent yellow or something. So when we shine a light and, on it, let's not have it just blend in with the charcoal of the wreck. Yeah, like we did an episode way back at the beginning of Killer Biographies, a German girl who falls out yes. of the plane. Like that plane crashed in into a jungle. So you can just imagine if you're looking in a thick jungle Unbelievable. and yeah. like a black box is tougher to find than like a fluorescent orange one. So today you'd put one of those Apple tags or, you know, like one of those tiles or something where you could just quickly locate it. You know, that'd be yeah. much more practical than like orange yeah. tape. But but certainly both better than a black box that's clearly going to just blend in with the crash site. Yeah. So uh, the black box. Anyway, so I think those are two important facts for the regular uh, Joe or Jolene to Thank know um, that uh, the bo black box is not in the cockpit back of the plane and it's not black. It's usually orange or yellow. And so that takes care of that. Over the years, the technology has gotten more and more advanced. Flight recorders now track more than 80 important wow. flight parameters during the flight. You know, they're telling you, you know, what's the heading, what's the pitch, what's, you know, all the different stuff. The other thing that really advances that technology is the advent of of digital yes. recording. Digital. See, digital yeah. makes all the difference. Mm -hmm. Today, uh, flight recorders are govern governed by international standards and recommended practices. For instance, a recorder must be able uh, to withstand acceleration of 3400 G oh. across six milliseconds. Oh. So basically, we're talking about an explosion. Right. There are um, similar minimum standards for withstanding high temperature fires, water exposure, and deep sea pressure. Yeah. Flight recorders are also required nowadays to be outfitted with an emergency underwater beacon, which activates automatically in a crash and helps the recovery crew locate both the wreckage and the black box. You would expect that a black box, especially nowadays, would at least have the technology that I have in my Apple Watch, right? Like if I'm, you know, submerged in a pool or on vacation, they'll find me underwater because of my Apple Watch. So you'd think like a commercial plane, like we're paying for technology, like they should have at least the ability to now you know what i'm saying i i do and we're gonna get there okay. we're gonna get okay. there despite all these um safeguards and despite the shock proofing and the emergency beacons and all that a significant number of uh so-called black boxes either fail or are just so badly damaged that they're useless or they're just never found at all i i kind of thought that that was the real exception but uh for at least 78 plane crashes since 1965 the black box was either just not found or it was just destroyed Oof, okay not a ringing endorsement like that those are stats you wouldn't want to feature in the advertising right? exactly yeah. yeah um for instance the two planes which uh, slammed into the world trade center on september 11th 2001 getting, yeah perhaps unsurprisingly those um black boxes were never found probably due 
to the raging fires and then, you know, two massive buildings collapsing on top of them. Uh, a more recent case where the black box was not found was the famous Malaysia Airlines oh, Flight 370. Yes. Do you remember this one? This is the one that disappeared? We never found it? You got wow, it. Wow, weird. So what happened? They couldn't track it via some beacon? <laughs> yeah, so... No one had an Apple Watch on that flight? <laughs> that one was going from Kuala Lumpur, another place I'd never Super been. Super exotic but sounding, cool. yeah. Doesn't it sound cool? It sounds amazing. Yeah. Koala Isn't that where his half brother was killed uh, in the airport? Um, oh, the North Korean yeah. leader. They got the girls to like yeah. uh, stab him. Yeah, with the reality show put the stabbing with the with the. No, I think it was like a handkerchief with poison. Anyway. Oh yeah, yeah. You're right. But it just sounds like a like there's just interesting stuff going. on. I am there. deathly afraid of it. But yeah, it sounds gambling, very exotic. gambling late at exotic night, cocktails. neon lights. Yeah, yeah, scary. They probably play like high ally there. Tropical winds. Okay, so the, the flight's going from Kuala Lumpur to Beijing. Scary. Except, <laughs> except at least it's not going to Baotou. Except for some reason, early in the flight, it starts to sort of make a U-turn. Mm. Head south, Ouch. and the plane winds up basically flying for eight straight hours just further and further south into the southern Indian Ocean. But it just, as as you said, it just disappeared. Disappeared. It's like Payne Stewart. Wasn't he in that flight that they think they lost oxygen and they just flew on till they ran out of fuel? Again, you're you're locked in uh, because that is one of the theories. Yeah. This, uh, well, anyway, so the plane's never found, although a few pieces of wreckage did later wash up along the east coast of uh, Africa. All 239 uh, people aboard are presumed dead. But as you mentioned with Payne Stewart, one of the prevailing theories is that there was a so-called hypoxia event. Something happened with the pressurization right. or with the oxygen system, and th that would render the passengers and crew first unconscious, and eventually they would die. But the plane just keeps going on basically on autopilot until the fuel runs out. Right. And then it would just, you know, probably go nose first into the ocean. <sighs> Yeah. Now, th that plane, there was a massive, extremely expensive search for that plane involving different countries. They thought they had a pretty good idea for, you know, the, the sector where it likely would have gone down, but they, the wreckage was never found. Oh, um, and this has caused people to renew their calls for some changes to black boxes. One of them is to increase the battery life of the emergency underwater beacon. The one for that was on that flight was said to be good for 30 days, but they said, listen, you know, here's a perfect example. We're searching a massive area of remote ocean. Like we need more than 30 days to, you know, it's, it's not that helpful if it only lasts 30 days. Another innovation, which has been suggested and which the U S Navy uses on some of its planes is what they call a deployable flight recorder, basically something that ejects from the plane, like it, based, it gets data from sensors and it can sort of sense moments before the explosion or moments before the impact, something's going on and the thing ejects from the plane what? and it's outfitted with like flotation stuff. So if you're over water, it'll float for a while. But see, just outfit every passenger with one of those. Like, what? <laughs> okay, yeah, the box survives, but we're all, what? <laughs> well, but the they were saying, like, if the, you know, if that thing had shot out of the uh, plane as it was going into its nosedive into the ocean, then it, it would have been floating on top of the water, sending out its emergency beacon. We would have, you know, that plane would have been found. That wreckage would have been found. But these um, suggested innovations have not yet been widely adopted or approved, but a bigger question is one you started to get to with the Apple Watch, where especially after um, Malaysia 370, people said, well, what in the world? Yeah. I mean, my iPhone Hello. is doing a, my iPhone's doing a better job. So then the question has become, why isn't all this data just being live streamed to the tower or to the ground right. all the time? Like, right. why are this is like archaic to be, you know, or relying on a black box that's like a needle in the haystack 20,000 feet under the ocean? Yeah, let's quickly jump to today's technology and make use of what's available. <laughs> uh, so I think probably eventually that is what will happen. But I mean, I got to say, just based on my own experience of airplane Wi-Fi, like it's, it's not going to be shoddy either. It's shoddy. I mean, you know, what's <laughs> yeah. so funny is I have an association with the black box when I was 
a kid, 10 or 11, we're driving up to Wisconsin from Chicago uh, for Memorial Day weekend. And on the way to Wisconsin, crash occurs at O'Hare on our left. So you see the smoke. And it was a flight, um, I think it was an American Airlines flight that crashed at O'Hare on that Friday, right before Memorial Day. It was flight 191. And the whole thing was, where's the black box? When are they going to get the black box? Because once they find the black box, we're going to know what happened. But I was so freaked out. It was crazy. Yeah, that is insane to be able to see the smoke on the You saw the smoke. It was one of the greatest air not greatest, biggest air disasters in history. There was an author on board who had just published a book and was going out to LA to promote her book. And on page 191, she wrote about her fear of flying and she was on okay. flight 191. That was the flight that crashed. Hold on. Back way up. How do you remember? Wait, it is not page 191. It's not page Yes, it was page 191. Oh my God. Yes, Judith Wax. That was a, she was a oh. local author. She was oh going to promote Lord. her book yeah. and Judith wrote about her fear of flying on page 191 of the book she was going to promote. Oh, Lord. I They had crashed right near the airport. Like, it barely went anywhere. I think for people of uh, our generation, so you and I are in our... F- um, yeah, you don't have to give out all this. I'm going to bleep that. Okay, go okay. on. Okay, for people who are... Um, in our In our... General 20-year span. Yeah. Well, middle-aged people, seniors, people middle like that. Age. I think that the black box, you know, is more part of our lexicon. Totally. And it was something that captured the imagination yes. back then because it was always like, oh, my God. Like, What are you going to hear you know, on that black box? Are they going to be screaming? Is it going to be yeah. calm? Are you going to get the right coordinates? Yeah, exactly. I mean, really, what we should have been saying all those years is the flight recorder or, right. you know, the orange box or right. you know, the red egg or whatever. It was just that name. That's what everyone called it. Yeah. But I agree. I bet it really, I had the same thing where I was, you know, I was the kid sitting there watching the TV, like, have they, you know, have they found the black box yet? Or, you know, wake up in the morning, did they get the black box? Crazy. Okay. For those of you, and you kind of hinted at it just now, for those listeners who share my own morbid curiosity yes. into such things, it is quite easy to find on YouTube uh, cockpit recordings uh, from various doomed flights Oof. across the years. Oh. Where you can, hear, don't want to hear a lot of these, you know, they become public information because they're part of a public investigation. And so you, you know, there are all different ones. I mean, some, the ending comes mercifully quick and it's just an explosion and you don't hear much of anything. There's other ones where it's clear that there's a, a problem with the aircraft equipment and it's, you know, kind of a long agonizing thing. There's an album by a German band called Ramstein okay. and the album is Reise, Reise, hey. Reise. Yeah. Right. So, right. So, okay. Nice pronunciation. <laughs> and, um, Good effort. There's a hidden track on there. Again, you can find it. You can listen to it on YouTube. That includes the last two minutes of uh, cockpit voice recordings from Japanese Airlines Flight 123, which crashed in 1985 and killed 500 oh, people. Why would you want to hear that? Why would they put that out commercially? And I got to say that it's exactly what you, like if you were scripting it for Hollywood, it's just like more and more alarms are going off and just the tenor of well, the I mean, so That's, that's like watching, uh, why would you watch that or hear that though you, if you have the choice not to? Morbid curiosity. I was the guy who went guess, out and yeah, investigated yeah. fatal wrecks. Okay, I mean, okay. on, you know, right. it takes, it takes all kinds. Yeah. I don't know if I'd want to hear okay. that specifically. I, I don't mind hearing a pod about that situation. I just yeah. don't know if I want to hear them actually in their time of, yeah, that, I don't know. It's horrendous. I yeah. mean, it's in Japanese, but you can tell exactly what's going on. There's even one in America. I'm not going to remember the detail. It might be Dallas or someplace like that, but where they're literally the pilot and his co-pilot and the stewardesses or like one stewardess or something are talking. And it's just like the 1970s. There's like, or maybe it's the early 80s but it's just sort of the low grade sexual harassment <sighs> and the just sort of like, you know, when I, the, oh, as yeah. I said, the off color stuff and the guy's like, well, we got to put something, something juicy on here, you know, for the, for the loved ones, if we go down and then sure enough on the takeoff, the plane crashes and they all die. And so that was what was on the black box. Oh, <laughs> yeah. 
That's scary. They didn't have a chance to. I'm sure the loved ones. To, to I'm sure the loved all. ones were happy to. Yeah, get that. Oh, thanks for leaving that behind. The part where you were sexually harassing the store. To- <laughs> you think like once you know you're going down, you're like, hey, can we just reset this audio? Because I mean, I don't think anyone needs to hear this. It happens so quickly. I mean, I could see sometimes doing that. Probably have enough time to push reset, right? Yeah, it maybe. doesn't require complex coding. I'm just saying, like, <laughs> quick delete. <laughs> Just that part about my, my my cheesy one-liners. Yeah, there's a lot of shouting back and forth. Like, so the crew member was like, dude, 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 dude reset right. that. Like, that could get lost in the sort of like, nice. nose up, nose up. You right. know? <laughs> okay, the uh, guy that wrote that book, I can't pronounce it, but the guy who wrote that book, Fight Club. Did you ever read yes, that? Yes, I never read that book. Chuck something, okay. Palinuk or something like that. But anyway, he also wrote a novel called Survivor. And the premise of that one is the entire thing is just being narrated by a member of a cult who is dictating it all into a flight recorder in the last hour or two before the fuel runs out and a plane crashes. Oh. Jeez. So that book, Survivor, the the flight recorder plays a key role. What else? We already mentioned the George Carlin joke, which yes. you knew right off the top. Great joke. Uh, one last fun fact, or maybe mm-hmm. not fun, but one last fact about black boxes. The record for the deepest underwater recovery of a flight recorder, Yes, South African Airways Flight 295 in 1987. That plane was on its way from Taiwan to South Africa mm-hmm. when fire broke out in the cargo hold and brought down the plane killing 149 uh, 159 people uplifting anecdote for this episode yeah the the cockpit voice recorder was later recovered from the ocean at a depth of 16,000 feet and that flight recorder did survive and was usable and the wow. audio did help confirm that it was in fact fire that was the cause of that crash right on a personal note i would still like to do a season of killer plane no, crashes someday I don't think so but i, I take your point which was listening. that yeah. and i take well i don't know there's to no. me there's some Mm-mm. yeah okay no. <laughs> Mm-mm. I think your objection initially was that would pretty much guarantee that one of us would die in a plane crash because then people would go back. It would be like your friend Judith. Do you wax. see me on ships? Do you see me crossing the ocean on a ship? Of course not. Yeah. Because then you'll be doing an episode in which you talk about the irony of me going down in a ship. Ride. Well, there would be no episode because I, I would I wouldn't know how to record an episode without That's you. True. You do That's all true. the technical stuff. Um, I don't know if you listened to that weird long Elon Musk interview at the deal. Not. Conference, no. kind of interesting, but he ended up saying in relation to something else, like that he has a friend who always says, "Whatever the most ironic outcome is, that's generally what ends up happening eventually." Hmm. So, yeah, if we did killer plane crashes, there's no question one of us at least would go down in a plane crash. Right. So there you have like Occam's razor, like sort of the most simplistic explanations, typically probably the the most likely uh, to be true, and then you have his situation where it's the irony. Was that what was that the rule? Exactly. Yeah. I mean, I could see that. You, your mind must uh you your mind because that's exactly how he explained it too. Oh, really? He, okay. he brought up Occam's razor as well. Oh, there you go. Me and um, Elon. I will yeah. I will say that it's easier to stay off boats than planes nowadays. Sure. So I wasn't really sure. worried with killer shipwrecks. Plus the shipwrecks we were doing was like, you know, Viking ships and yeah, Spanish. So cool. I can't wait to do some... more of those. I mean, don't you agree? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I'm down whenever you want. Yeah, it. those are great. Um, those are great. But as you've noticed, I mean, I do like a, a plane crash story you do. with the you Juliana do. Kepke back in um killer biographies. I, there's something about them that fascinates me. Yeah. I will say that I do have dreams about playing. I don't know if I was in one in a past life, but I dream about plane crashes. For yeah, sure. I've I've definitely had a fear with plane crashes. And, you know, again, some rooted in the fact that as a 10 or 11 year old, I, I was witness to one of the greatest air disasters in all of history, uh, right out my window uh, at O'Hare, where I would fly out of all the time. So it definitely was traumatic. It's scary. There was another one in 65, I think, where they did not recover the flight recorder, where um, it was from LaGuardia to O'Hare. And it crashed into Lake Michigan. Oof. Well, this was on its way to LA. You know, it was like Chicago yeah. to LA. It's like, there you go. But you would say now they have more sophisticated data capture, voice, video. Like, is it, it has, is it all changed yeah, now? I mean, that's more standard. Yeah. I mean, when you like the early, early days, they're just capturing the basics, like speed, altitude, whatever. And they're using these janky things like. But Malaysia coil. wasn't that long ago. Malaysia Airlines. Oh, Malaysia. Were, no, by then, uh, yeah. It, you know, it's digital recording and it's capturing 80. But we still know, don't know where it is. Parameters. So there's no beacons. Couldn't find it. Well, no, they had the beacon, but it's 
it's just, and it was sounding probably for 30 days, uh, but it was also, you know, probably 15,000 feet underwater. And it was taking people a while to figure out, you know, where exactly to right. search. So that's why they were suggesting, hey, you know, these beacons should last for two months. And um, these black boxes should be like sort of in a place where they can just pop out of the plane as it's going into a nosedive. Right. You know, someday someone's going to find that wreckage at the bottom of wherever. Like they're going. I mean, you can know, you happen. imagine that? Can you imagine running the submersible? You know, it's like the dude. Uh, who was it? Was it Ballard or um, Robert Ballard? Whoever you know first came up on the Titanic. Can Unbelievable. You no, I the can't imagine. That you no. Have? No, it's insane. But they are still, you know, like I said, bits of it have wa- have washed up on Africa. There was a little bit that showed up and it had the, um, like the, I guess the engines for that uh, plane were Rolls Royce engines. Okay. And so it Just had like Alcock and Brown. They had the Rolls Royce engines. They did? They did. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So you could see like the little RR insignia. Oh, and okay. so that was part of how they knew, okay, this came from that. Yeah. And I got to say that unlike you, as a kid, I didn't have a fear at all about flying. I just assumed like No, yeah. not as a kid I didn't. But later then, I did after 11 after that crash. And then when I was like just finishing high school and and starting college, I worked for two summers with my oldest sibling who um, worked for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service up in Alaska. Yeah, cool. And so we were working in the middle of nowhere, like doing fish surveys and stuff. And we were constantly using those little um, puddle the jumper planes. planes. Yeah. yeah, the bush planes. Yeah. And um, there was this guy, Reed, that would fly us around. So you don't want to know, know your pilot's first name. You should not be on a first name basis. That's my whole point. That's when <laughs> bad things happen. You don't want to know Reed your said pilot's he, first he name. Reed it was instrument rated. I don't, Reed said he was. I don't speaking know. Of, <laughs> speaking of instruments i mean what i was going to say is you don't want to yeah a know your pilot's first name but b then look out there while he's got a cigarette in his mouth and a <laughs> wrench and he's working on the plane engine right good news is he's working on the plane engine bad news is he's working on the plane engine like what do you read but as a 19 year old i was just like oh cool this is like a ferris wheel it's like a roller coaster you know now having prepped this show i'm like oh god like things go wrong all the time so what was the connection you had in mind when you referenced that this uh, related to my family? Um, I believe your father-in-law was a pilot. My father-in-law, yes, commercial airline pilot for many years. For many years. Pan Am and Delta. Yeah, I was a little bit worried because I was like... You know, Fortunately, didn't have any use of the black box. However, his co-workers were on the Lockerbie flight. That was a plane that oh, then he would fly no. from New York to Italy. No. So he did know a lot of the, the people involved in that disaster. So the black box, you just, know, part of that. Just horrendous. Horrible. But I did feel a little bit nervous because I, I knew uh, Howard will be listening and he's going to know yes. all the different mistakes I make. But <laughs> so in this case, he will play the role of Charlotte and he'll bring us up to date on all the things we screwed up. Important the, the important takeaway pieces of information, black box, not black, in the back Correct. of the plane. Back of the plane, not near the pilots. Yeah. Yeah. And um, I don't know. I was just always fascinated by them. Fantastic. Yeah, no, super interesting. It's something I would have never considered looking up. You know, there are certain things where you might want to Google it like, ah, what the heck does that mean again? Never would have thought to Google and, and look up what the black box was all about. I'm the opposite. When you were a kid, when we were kids, did you ever watch that show When Havoc Struck? No, never heard of oh, that show. Oh, man, that was amazing. What the heck My is that? My friend and I used to watch it. Um, <laughs> when Havoc Struck, I don't know, some show is just about disasters, you know, and hmm. like, you know, they're fascinating. Or did you ever, like, I remember watching the movie the poseidon adventure yes just being of course. like oh my god this super is super like exciting terrifying yeah. but it, it's it, in a way it's kind of exciting because you get to watch it in your cozy in your like movie theater i mean there, those disaster films definitely put you and, and you know still to this day i sometimes if i can't fall asleep i'll reflect upon some of these shipwreck stories and just what it was like on those ships and just be like thankful i'm not on one of those ships well yeah because those to me in a sense are worse like a, you know a plane if it blows up that's horrendous but like maybe it ends quickly Where, whereas like those guys on the uss indianapolis like they're in the water for hours and sharks are coming at them and like terrible. that's terrible just terrible well, Colonel Tor, fantastic story. Uh, definitely got us out of our single person chemist, you know, bent that we were on, uh, which is very exciting and enlightened us 
to uh, you know a piece of technology that not a lot of information generally know. I had fun researching it. Thank you for your great questions. Uh, were you going to give us a tease on episode four, or we got to wait? I am not. Yeah, it's going to be one of those just wait and see. I've considered several different inventions. I may have to combine two. Who knows? You're going to have to tune in next time to see what we uh, what we settle on. Can't wait. All right, let's play our outro music and we'll see you next time with another invention on Killer Means Awesome, Season 3, Killer Inventions. Sayonara. Thank you.